Investing in technology is back. Venture capitalist uh, Neil Dempsey tells us how. Next on Entrepreneurs and Innovators. This Entrepreneurs and Innovators program is brought to you by a grant from the Center for Technology Entrepreneurship at the University of Washington Business School and by a grant from PEMCO Insurance. Entrepreneurs and Innovators. Exploring the ideas and personalities of the men and women creating our rich business climate. The hosts for Entrepreneurs and Innovators are Bud Saxberg, professor at the University of Washington School of Business, and Briar Dudley, technology and business reporter, The Seattle Times. And, and one of them asked me to join them uh, as a potential investor for, the, for that firm, and the firm was Bay Partners, and that's who I work for today and I'm part of, and I'm the managing partner of Bay. And I think that's really kind of, it was kind of a circuitous route, meaning big companies to small companies to starting my own, and then now I'm helping others start companies uh, from scratch. And, uh, which company was it that you feel was the uh, most instrumental in, in kind of uh, lightening up the idea in you that, hey, I could kind of be on my own? Well, I think that, that I had great experience at Harris Corporation from little divisions to big divisions, and I saw the difference between running a little and being involved in a little division versus the big one. And so when I did leave the big company to go start my own, I wanted to get into some company that I could really control and manage and be part of and have my decisions and my thoughts really utilized. And probably the last one that, that we it was named Cubic, so we had a good, good fortune of taking it public and then subsequently selling it. And, and I learned a lot about the ups and downs of small businesses and how dependent you are on sales each quarter and each month and, and how important good people are and how, how important the right strategy is and, and also a whole lot of luck. Never, never uh, underestimate the value of luck in a small business or in life in general. Could you tell us a little bit about Bay and what your role is there? Yeah, Bay Partners is a venture capital partnership. Uh, there are six partners. I'm uh, the managing partner, and we invest in seed, early stage technology companies, meaning that we start them from scratch. We start them basically on a napkin in a restaurant in, or in some other place in Silicon Valley. Uh, entrepreneurs come to us. We, we reach out for entrepreneurs. We receive referrals from, from other investments that we've made, and we're basically the kind of the classic organization that starts small companies in a technology space. We focus on uh, software, hardware, and semiconductors only. We do, we do nothing else except information technology. And, and primarily most of them are early uh, raw startups with just an idea and a, one or two people. We've had, never had a fund lose money, ever. Now, we might now, because the, the year 1999 was the year of the bubble. And there was a lot of investments made at very high prices and small ownership and uh, markets kind of eroded quickly and fell apart. And some of those investments didn't do so well. Mm -hmm. So they measure venture capital firms by, uh, by years. So the 99 vintage year is a bad vintage for all venture capital firms in our sector yeah. currently. But it's not over because you have till 2009 yeah. before the 10-year the period expires. Where, where are we now in the recovery? Oh, we're in, the, in our business, we're well on our way. Um, there, I've never seen such high activity for early stage startup companies. We're competing on every deal. We're competing with four or five firms to win the opportunity to invest with some quality firms because the ideas are, are high quality, the teams are good, and you know we're just crazy activity. A simple pinball, pulling it down. Come on, come on, baby. <laughs> they call her the rocket for her high energy and smarts. She has entrepreneurship in her genes. Helen Rocky is next on Entrepreneurs and Innovators. Helen Rocky appeared on Entrepreneurs and Innovators 10 years ago when she led Brooks Sports to national prominence. 
After that, she became CEO of Alabama-based Just Four Feet, but soon found herself negotiating bankruptcy and sell-off. With uh, important lessons learned, uh, she shepherded Front Porch Classics through an expanded product line of nostalgic board games and a merger with Sababa Toys. Now Helen is building Wild Blue that produces women's sleepwear for women suffering from hot flashes and night sweats. Her products are receiving rave reviews. Helen is someone who knows the ups and downs of creating businesses, both large and small. It's a fun story. Um, I was CEO of a local running shoe company, Brooks Sports. We were very small at the time, and we were trying to come up with a way to market the company. And drawing on some experiences uh, from my prior career at Nike, we decided to make up a bunch of t-shirts, put our logo on them, and give them away at marathons across the country. And we thought, well, as long as we're giving away t-shirts, let's make them out of a fiber that marathon runners will really appreciate. And we found a patented fiber that wicks the moisture from your body, dries four times faster than cotton. We put our logo on it, and we gave out thousands of shirts, Boston, New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, and we got our picture in the paper. Um, and about six months later, the phone starts ringing. It's women, men and women, but mostly women. They've been sleeping in the t-shirts. The t-shirts are wearing out, and they're panicked. They say, I can't sleep in anything else. It's the only thing that keeps me cool and dry when I have hot flashes or night sweats while sleeping. So the light bulb did go on. How do you protect your intellectual property here, which I guess would be using this special fiber? Yeah. You, how can you prevent other people from copying it, even, even your manufacturers in China? Right. Technically, we can't. Um, we did work, I worked about a year to get the fabric just the right softness, just the right weight. Um, and I was able to negotiate, at least with our factory, that they would only use that fabric for us. But the truth of the matter is, and that's one reason in apparel in general, and maybe as entrepreneurs in many businesses, you got to hustle. We started Wild Blue, and then I was asked to um, take the job at Front Porch Classics, which I did. And th that was a, a little bit of a turnaround also, so that's a full-time deal. So um, my husband, Jay, uh, stepped in, and he's just done a great job. He's organized the warehouse, the operations, the sales. He's a terrific salesman. All the gals love him <laughs> everywhere he goes. And he gets to go to the lingerie trade shows, so he's very happy about that. Um, no, he's done a really good job. We, we do joke um, and call him the king of menopause <laughs> because these women call and they tell him everything. I said, you're going to have to keep a book, honey, so maybe he'll have to someday. But it's a product that really works, and people are so happy when they've tried it that they have to call and tell you. And it, that makes it really rewarding, you know, even if you're just a small company, just to have somebody call and say, oh, my God, it's the first time I've slept through the night in months. It really makes you feel good. Tired of low returns from your investments or no returns? Bryce James shows us his new way. He's next on Entrepreneurs and Innovators. After 20 years of building wealth for individuals, Bryce James has turned his success and knowledge into a new investment approach. It's called Smart Portfolios. It uses an approach called Dynamic Portfolio Optimization. Bryce says it reduces risk and increases returns. Is it the holy grail for investors? Bryce, we're anxious to find out how you do it. Welcome to Entrepreneurs and Innovators. Bryce, you've been a successful investment advisor and uh, you've come up with a new way to manage investments. What's wrong with the way we've been doing it? That's a good question. I think, Breyer, I don't know if it's a question of what's wrong, it's just that they haven't been working. And a lot of that has to do with uh, a lot of methodologies that we use to create our strategies and our optimization processes and other strategies. So, in my opinion, it's, it's more that we need to recreate and redefine how we manage money. Uh, what's your way? Well, I think the flaw is at some point somebody is playing um, God as far as how you set that investment policy mix. Why should you have that investment policy mix at that level? What methodology is being used to create that investment policy mix? 
And uh, a lot of the research has been proven that 91.5% of portfolio performance comes from the asset allocation piece. So the methodology used to determine the asset allocation, all of the investment policy mix, is the question that we're addressing. One of the major attributes for managing money is being able to understand how we measure risk and risk in a portfolio. And for years, we've used standard deviation as the main method for measuring risk. Standard deviation, like your bell curve in school, measuring the highs and lows and the, the average return that you expect to receive from a portfolio. Ten years ago, a firm called JP Morgan came up with an idea called value at risk. They decided to look at the probability of losing money as opposed to how volatile an account is. And so during extreme periods of time, they wanted to understand that they might have a probability of losing X percent or more on a given day. And this is a better measure of risk because you better understand how much you have at risk on a given day. The problem is this methodology does not anticipate outliers, which are extreme events such as the 9-11 events, Asian currency crisis, the Russian bond default. And so what we simply do is look at all the probable losses that could possibly occur to your account. And we call this methodology expected shortfall. And under expected shortfall, we can now understand that things such as the Asian currency crisis or Russian bond default occur, and we want to value that into our pricing of our, of our models to better understand how much risk we're currently taking in a portfolio. Asset allocation is, to me, the biggest uh, fluff word in the business. It means nothing to 99% to of the people out there. And really, um, when, they, when these statements come out that 91.5% of your portfolio allocation is of the variation in your returns is attributed to asset allocation, why hasn't anybody ever done research on the different asset allocation models that are in the marketplace? If it's that much and that meaningful, why hasn't everybody uh, all the brokerage firms gone after that and actually done due diligence on the different optimization solutions. That's where I was the most shocked. To me, that's the biggest gaping hole in the business. And that's what we did. We weren't setting out to set up smart portfolios. We were just trying to find a better optimization solution for our hedge fund managers. And through that due diligence of looking at the different 50, firm, 50 different allocation firms, optimization solutions in the marketplace, we couldn't find one that was incorporating the best of breed in each of these separate attributes. And it was at that point that we realized it needs to be done. And that's exactly how we got into it. So you're exactly right. Asset allocation is a meaningless term. You read about it and they never tell you the process for how they do it because it, it's just not well defined. It's a big floating gray area of matter. And what we wanted to do is make it a very precise, uh, demonstrable uh, metric that we say, here's exactly how much risk, uh, here's how they measure their return, here's how that optimization tool, for example, measures their, their uh, diversification, and, and that's, ex that's exactly how we got into business.